today we'll start the lecture series. Hey, today we'll start the lecture series on scientific visualization. Uh, this is Aaron Noll. Aaron Noll is a research, research scientist at Ski. Aaron got his PhD from Utah, and he's an expert in, in uh, scientific spatial <coughs> visualization. So he'll take over uh, the couple of remaining like five lectures in total. I think coming up this one to, uh, today, and then uh, on Thursday we have a guest lecture. Uh, and then Aaron will continue until the last week when we do project presentations. Um, are there any organizational questions before we get started? Great, so on Thursday there will be Janet Yuasa talking about molecular animation. Uh, uh, this lecture is, is uh, pretty amazing, so I definitely recommend you come. I'll also send out a reminder uh, to everybody else. Um, and so I guess let's talk about goods today. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Alex. So, um, yeah, uh, as Alex said, um, I think it's four lectures that I'm giving, and then Janet's giving one. Okay. Um, but yeah, th that's, that's basically the idea. Uh, everything that Alex has talked about up until this point is really in business class general data visualization. Um, and uh, I guess these lectures are going to be a little bit of a change in pace. Um, and I guess maybe I should ask, ask for a show of hands how many people have taken computer graphics before. Just to, get a, just to get an idea. Show of hands, who's taking computer graphics? Okay, in that case that's good because I, I think we're going to keep it at a fairly high level. Um, I guess next lecture there will be a little bit more graphics, but again, I'll keep it fairly general. And uh, yeah, anybody who's really going into this should probably take uh, the entry, uh, entry level graphics class. Uh, but yeah, uh, so um, I guess just, just to give, give a little background, um, these uh, divisions in what's InfoViz, SciViz, and VAST are rapidly uh, going away, but at least for the last, what is it, uh, 18 years now that they've had these, uh, the, the classifications at, at, at Triple E Week, they've had scientific visualization, information visualization, I think VAST came last, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, uh, VAST is like, I want to say circa 2003. Um, and, um, it, and they've been more or less uh, how we thought of visualization as a discipline. So scientific visualization, what I'll, I'll talk about today, is predominantly an offshoot of computer graphics. And the idea is that uh, you're looking at scientific data that have some spatial context um, or are mostly interesting with respect to their spatial context. So these are usually coming from simulation sources or from scan sources like a CT or MRI. Um, and you're really interested in how you map uh, these spatial quantities to actual colors, or in some cases, geometry. So usually you have, uh, what I'll talk about especially today, you'll have uh, a, um, a field or a collection of fields over space and time, uh, we call this field F, and you're mapping this to some color at the end of the day, some uh, red, green, blue, and alpha channel. Uh, and these are all sort of standard concepts in graphics, but th this is really the turf of scientific or spatial visualization. And um, even though it's a gross simplification to call it this, this is really you know, 2D or 3D graphics for viz. Um, and map visualization, like GIS visualization, I'd say in a lot of ways is almost more of a scientific viz discipline than, I guess, a data viz discipline. But then again, these are really just sort of arbitrary divisions. Um, what Alex has talked about so far in this class is really information visualization. I won't waste time by going over these because Alex has covered it far better than this one slide will. Um, and, I, uh, and then, of course, there's visual analytics, which is not so much about the techniques themselves, but really about the user interfaces for data analysis. Uh, so it's more about how you build a big system uh, like, uh, like an R or a MATLAB or, uh, or, an a or a SAS or something like that compared to uh, just the technique in InfoBiz or SciBiz. Um, and I always like to show this slide, that this idea that really all these techniques, it, this, these divisions are sort of arbitrary. They're more a function of the fact that we have academic communities than the fact that there are separate disciplines. Uh, and we're rapidly seeing SciBiz and InfoBiz being combined. Uh, all of them being combined with VAST, so they're, they're really, in a sense, uh, different techniques, but really the same field uh, of data visualization. Uh, so yes, uh, uh, scientific visualization or spatial visualization is really about interpreting and rendering spatial data. And I'll talk today about where these data come from, so the actual scientific domains, how they're represented, uh, so specifically grids and meshes, um, although we call them just generally grids, and what we can do with them. Uh, and then I'll talk about this concept of direct visualization versus indirect visualization. Uh, then uh, finally, I'll, if there's time, hopefully there will be, I'll talk about interpolation, which is how we go from the, the discrete grid setting to a continuous um, uh, scalar field or, or other field. Uh, so 
I think these dates are all incorrect. Uh, no, wait, no, they're, they're correct. Yeah, so today's, um, I'm sorry, next Tuesday is going to be volumes. Then after that, we'll talk about isosurfaces. That might be incorrect. And then I'll have a uh, lecture on uh, vector and tensor real visualization. <coughs> so let's see, data sources. Where do these data come from? Um, so the, the type of data that I'm most used to seeing uh, are computational data. And these are um, largely the output of scientific computing uh, codes. So people want to run a simulation uh, for physics, computational chemistry, um, uh, weather or climate, uh, and these will generate these scalar fields, very often many, many, many scalar fields, and they will be the source for scientific visualization we want to do. And there is an enormous variety of different computational codes um, that, that uh, range in uh, not just discipline, but also in terms of the size of data, going from kilobytes to uh, really starting with a, the smallest chemistry code I can think of, all the way to petabytes or even exabytes uh, for the most recent uh, cosmology simulations that I've seen out of Argonne National Laboratory. Um, and what's interesting is that we, uh, very often, we cannot actually visualize some of the largest scale computations we have out there. I'd say we are 10 years and maybe two orders of magnitude behind the times in terms of what HPC can generate versus what we can do in viz. Um, so that's an ongoing challenge in spatial visualization. Um, and the other source of these data are, of course, scanned data. And this is really not so much about uh, computing, uh, co uh, computing data from some uh, theoretical model that's been implemented uh, using a numerical algorithm, but from actual um, imaging, uh, imaging devices, uh, various types uh, that, that generate, uh, in a lot of cases, equally large or larger data than what you get out of computational codes. Um, so this really comes from diverse domains such as X-ray crystallography, uh, synchrotron or radiation light sources. I saw a lot of these in my, my time at Argonne. Um, uh, you're, uh, also my various microscopy devices like uh, CEM, uh, TEM. And in medical domains we have devices like ultrasound, MRIs, CT scans. And then lastly, uh, cosmology and astronomy. Um, you have uh, satellite and telescopes, uh, especially uh, uh, um, especially radio telescope and um, uh, large uh, uh, and, um, and things like Hubble um, uh, that generate enormous uh, uh, spectral imagery of the uh, of the universe in the night sky. Um, so these again go from scales at, at the angstrom level or even smaller than that, uh, all the way up to megaparsecs. So we have enormously different uh, space scales. Uh, and generally, uh, we have up to uh, petabytes uh, or even exabytes of data that represent, uh, especially the, the telescope data. So now I'll talk about how these data are represented, um, specifically grids. Um, before talking about grids, I'll talk about uh, fields. Um, mathematically, a field is a set of elements uh, with some basic uh, algebraic operators like addition and multiplication. Um, and they all satisfy the so-called field axioms. Uh, so associativity, community, uh, commutativity, uh, distribution, identity, and there's an inverse as well. Um, and intuitively, uh, this is really a varying quantity defined continuously over space. The idea is that you can pick a point anywhere in this field and you'll be able to say this is the value at this point and it's, uh, this value ideally isn't going to change very much as you go over small distances, but it can change a lot as you go over large distances. So very often you'll hear about this notion of contraction in, in fields. Um, that's a field. Um, what do these look like? Well, with, with a 2D um, a representation of fields, you can have a, a scalar field in a, in a 2D domain. You can have a vector field using these hedgehog glyphs. Uh, this is really just a, a vector tuple at, um, at, at each point. Um, and you can, again, interpolate this to, uh, to get what's in between. And then lastly, you have tensor fields, where each element is a tensor. Uh, so it's really a, a, co a combination of uh, vectors that, uh, that form the tensor. And you can even have uh, arbitrary matrices as elements in a field. So this is just one element, or maybe one tuple, uh, per, um, per value in field. Uh, but you can also have fields that have distinct attributes or distinct values. Uh, so a lot of uh, recent uh, research in, in spatial visualization has centered on multi-fields, 
where you have um, multiple scalars per field, and each scalar is really a completely different attribute entirely. It's not a vector where you're really interested in these numbers at the same time. You're interested in completely different behaviors that you'll see from these uh, varying multi-fields. So here we have um, this visualization that my, my colleague Joe Ensley at Argon did. Um, it's uh, showing four different fields of a radiation hydrodynamic simulation in the ENZO computational code. Um, I wonder if I can even show the video. The, vi the video is pretty fun. Um, I'll just give you a quick idea of what these look like. Do you want the audio? I don't think there's audio. Yeah, the National Lab guys don't talk a lot. <laughs> but this is, I'd say, your, your prototypical volume <coughs> visualization. Um, you have uh, four different scalar fields, four different transfer functions, which are essentially color maps plus opacity. And they're going to change the color maps. They're rotating the volume at the same time. Um, this is a, a technique called volume rendering that I'll talk in depth about next, uh, next lecture, uh, so next Tuesday. You can sort of see um, you have the same camera viewpoint for each field, but each field behaves very, very differently. What's the data? Um, it is cosmology data. Uh, it's, um, we have a, a regular matter density, dark matter density, uh, emissivity, and gray radiation energy. Um, this is one of the ENZO simulation runs that came out of SDSC, I want to say about, might be about eight years ago now. Uh, it's a fairly, fairly old run. But now they're, they're generating runs like this. I actually just spoke this morning at Supercomputing to uh, one of the hack scientists, and they're, they're generating um, a, a larger equivalents of this uh, with, uh, I think it's up to 1.1 trillion particles that they would use for the computation. Let's go back. <clears throat> there we go. And it's not just cosmology, but uh, um, where you have four different, um, completely different attributes that you've computed, but also in computational chemistry. Here we have um, four different molecular <coughs> orbitals out of a uh, 800 molecular orbital uh, uh, density functional theory computation. Uh, that came out of uh, some collaborators at USC. So you can see this concept of scalar field, it's more of a mathematical concept that's, than something that's really tied to a specific type of data, but you see it everywhere in pretty much every scientific computation or, or piece of theory that, uh, that you deal with in spatial events. So when, when we're talking about types and classification of field data, um, it, it, there's a wide range, and I just gave you two examples of um, sort of a basic scalar field, vector field, tensor field, and multi-field data. Um, but here's a, a way of thinking of it. You have, um, on the bottom axis, you have the dimension of the domain, and then you have the dimension of the data type or the range. And generally, um, anything that you have in this lower qu uh, quadrant, when you have sort of low, um, you have high dimension domain, um, this ends up being um, uh, more or less in the side uh, domain, and then things that are, tend to be up on the, the upper end, where you have a lot of range dimensions, dimensions, they tend to be more infobiz or general data visualization domain. Um, but again, there's, there's no necessarily rhyme or reason to how you classify this. Um, yeah, so for example, multi fields, this would be high dimensional range. And you, but you can also have infobiz that's con considered uh, to be what, uh, 0D or 1D dimension type, but you could also commit, uh, consider it to be in this column right here, where you have 1D spatial domain. There are lots of ways of, uh, of considering it. I'd say it actually it, it covers multiple parts of, in fact, this entire table when you think about it. Um, so these are just a few examples of how you classify uh, spatial data according to domain and range. So grids. Um, what we talked about so far, uh, scalar fields, vector fields, tensor, etc. In multi-fields, um, fields are really um, an illusion. At some level, everything is discrete. Even if you read the, uh, the uh, uh, theoretical physics literature, 
uh, basically, everyone seems to think that yes, uh, <laughs> fundamentally everything is discrete uh, once you get down to uh, the, uh, the particle level. And even uh, when you're thinking about theories of gravitation, uh, there's this concept of Planck length uh, that sort of implies that there's a discrete unit, we just don't know what it is. Um, so all data, at least that we deal with in a computational setting, are discrete. And we, cho we choose to discretize them based on what works best for the algorithms that we have to work with, like finite elements or finite differences, and what's computationally efficient for the architecture or the computing resources we have uh, to work with. And visualization software implements a wide range of data models to handle all of these different grids. So some examples, um, the example that I showed you in that video, that was all regular grid data. Um, that was computed over like a big block of values, kind of like a three-dimensional image. But there are also tetrahedral meshes, hexahedral meshes. Uh, these are an example of unstructured uh, data, or at least unstructured geometric data. And there's also adaptive mesh refinement, which is uh, sort of like overlaid blocks, or you can have oak trees, uh, sort of re like regular grids, but hierarchical. And then you can have raw particle simulations, like Lagrangian simulations. Um, so um, these are generally classified uh, in terms of uh, the nomenclature structured versus unstructured. Um, and this nomenclature comes largely from the database world and it's been somewhat bastardized by the spatial slash scientific phys community. Uh, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> um, generally from the database world, structured data are data that have some notion of an index. So you can access them via hash, array, or other query. And uh, the search time for this is usually uh, either uh, constant time or very close to it. And unstructured data are data that are not indexed, and you have to do some sort of brute force, or usually linear or even worse, search to find them. Uh, so the search time is going to be linear. And, um, and I guess, Alex, did have, have you talked about structured versus unstructured in an earlier lecture? I was talking about text video images in the first lecture, but ah, yeah. much more. Yeah, I mean, I guess this is really more of a database uh, concept than, than a data viz concept. But yeah, structured means that you've already gone through your data and you've created an index of some kind, and unstructured means you haven't or you don't know. Uh, so it can be out there somewhere and you have to figure out a way to, uh, to reconstruct where it lives uh, in, this, in this field. Um, so in scientific visualization, this, this uh, can get a little bit confusing. And uh, there are also two separate concepts besides structured and unstructured. There's this, con uh, this concept of geometry versus topology. So geometry is actually a fairly simple concept. It's really the position of vertices in Euclidean space, which can be, and this, these positions in, in themselves are sort of a structure. So this, these positions can be uniform, structured, or unstructured. And then you have the topology, which is really the connectivity, so how the vertices are connected together. And this can also have its own structure. Uh, so the topology, a better way to think of it is, um, are they just completely uh, connected to each other in, in a, in a uh, typical simplicial complex, like a mesh, or is it more like a 3D grid? Um, so it's really how the cells are connected together. Uh, so I'll give, I'll give you some examples of this. Um, but ba basically there's geometry and topology, and most of the time in uh, spatial visualization, when people talk about structured or unstructured, they're really talking about the geometry. So the simplest type of data um, is really a uniform grid. And here you have, uh, and this is exactly like what we saw in the video before with the cosmology data. We have uniform spacing along the axes, uh, also known as raster data. Most volume data sets uh, that we're isosurfacing or volume rendering or doing things to, most of them look like this just because it's the easiest convention and it's the most common type. And usually when people are talking about structured data in terms of scientific visualization, this is what they mean. Um, you still, of course, need to know the, uh, metadata that tells you maybe what, what the data is, uh, the uh, size, so, so the dimensions of each axis, kind of like the uh, dimensions of an image. But once you have that, you're able to um, figure out where everything is and uh, just look it up. It's just usually row order or column order, and you're done. Uh, so this is the easiest uh, grid to work with. Um, 
So uh, in, in case that this was confusing, hopefully it wasn't, <laughs> it's uh, really just the 3D equivalent of a 2D image. Um, uh, you're uh, able to pick out any arbitrary point in between the interpolation, which we'll talk about at the end of the lecture, and really each volume data set um, is a collection of uh, voxels. Um, sometimes these are referred to as cells. Um, that in itself is actually a very separate topic about uh, what's uh, cell-centered versus node-centered, uh, but I won't go into that today. Um, if you're really interested in that, there's some information in the, uh, in the BTK uh, uh, paper the, by Stefan Bruckner uh, that uh, I, I shared as reading. But uh, in a sense, uh, all you really have to worry about is these are the vertices of the voxel, and they're what you want to interpolate between if you want to pick an arbitrary sample, and this is your grid. <coughs> And uh, this is a quick uh, analogy I'll give of the hazards of uh, <coughs> interpreting structure, even simple structure data that you think nothing could go wrong with, interpreting it in the wrong way. Um, so um, the uh, oh, okay. Um, so the, there's um, the Arecibo message, which was uh, a um, sort of thought experiment more than anything else where we actually sent an encoded message, um, a 2D image, uh, um, via, radio uh, via a, uh, a radio telescope in Puerto Rico, and we wanted to send it to a galaxy that was 25,000 uh, light years away. And this is the message that we, we actually sent. It was 1679 bits, encoded as uh, uh, 20, 20, 2380 megahertz, plus and minus some frequency, and it's a sequence of 1D bits over time. And the idea is that you're going to send out this message and hope that an alien might be able to reconstruct some information from it. Um, there's no meta information whatsoever. You're just going to send this, uh, these bits out, kind of like a, a cosmic Morse code, and hope that some civilization somewhere out there is going to be able to make some sense of it, uh, or say, hey, maybe there's somebody out there. Um, so there are lots of ways to interpret, uh, of interpreting this. Uh, one, one way, if you just sort of take like a barcode representation, would be uh, uh, you end up with something like this, and you'd wonder, okay, what does black and what does white mean? Um, uh, and, the, and they carefully chose the resolution of this grid to be uh, the product of two primes. I'm not sure if this would really help, but, but this, is, uh, uh, this is the idea is maybe they would uh, notice that this is a product of two relatively small prime numbers, uh, 23, and 23 by 73. And then they would say, okay, maybe, um, maybe this is not a linear sequence, so maybe it's a 2D array, maybe we can interpret it that way. Um, of course, you don't know uh, which axis is up and which axis is uh, right, but yeah, that's, uh, you're, you're still getting somewhere. Um, and you still have, then you have to figure out how you lay it out in 2D space, and then you have to decipher it. Um, so, so this is what the Arecibo message was supposed to say. It was sort of like, um, you know, really, really bad 2D pixel art that you'd see from you know an early workstation, and probably the, you know, in the 70s. But, you know, but this is this is basically computer graphics in the 70s, <laughs> right here. Um, so you'd see a little guy, uh, it, it, you know, kind of looks humanoid. Uh, I'm not sure what this stuff is supposed to be, um, but again, even here, there's so many ways of uh, interpreting this data. And anecdotally, the number of times I've had uh, raw scientific visualization come my way, and I didn't know what the uh, dimensions of it were, and I've had to go and reverse engineer it. Um, I've probably had that happen a dozen times in, in my career, and it's, it's painful even when you kind of know what to expect, but let me just say the Arecibo message is never going to get deciphered by anybody, no matter how advanced. <laughs> um, so, okay, uh, moving, so to make a long story short, um, uh, even sim the simplest type of structure data that should be the simplest to decipher without metadata, without um, some sense of, um, uh, of semantics, you're basically screwed. You, you cannot, uh, it's, it's going to be very tough to decipher it. Um, so uh, moving on from the simplest type of data from uniform grids, we're going to talk about uh, rectilinear grid geometry which are still structured data. Uh, they're structured both uh, with respect to topology and geometry, but they're non-uniform in terms of their spacing along the axes. So here you have your raw data, and then you have also some two different arrays that tell you the spacing along the x, y, and z axis. 
Um, and this is actually more common than you'd think. A lot of meteorology and climatology data comes in a form like this. Uh, this is a, a visualization of some, of some of the turbulence in the ionosphere that another colleague, Greg Fossett Tack, worked on. Um, and again, this is very similar to uniform grid, but, um, uh, but it's just slightly different, so you have to have a visualization code base that can, that can handle this. Um, and actually, not a lot can. Uh, this is, uh, we're starting to get into um, the reasons why you'd start to need to have data models like, uh, like VTK. Um, and now we're going to talk about um, unstructured geometry, data with no structure whatsoever. Um, so here we have just raw points in space, and uh, we, all we have are the x, y, z positions of vertices and maybe some attribute uh, at each vertex. Um, so this is, uh, these are actually more common than you might think. Some of the largest computational and scan data that I can think of come in this form. Uh, so there was a LiDAR database from uh, uh, SDSC that they were hosting where we ended up having something on the order of um, 700, uh, 700 billion particles if we took the whole database and turned them into points. Um, and we looked at a 30 billion particle subset for a project a little while ago. Uh, but there's also these, co these cosmology simulations like the ones I was showing in the video earlier. Most of these are actually particle simulations that are done on... Um, on a grid, but they, the particles are what are actually stored out. Um, and if you just look at the particle data and you don't have the grid, you'll, uh, you'll need a technique for um, interpreting that particle data. So here is a 30 billion particle uh, rendering that uh, I worked on with, uh, uh, with uh, Inga Wald and the, the Osprey team, uh, uh, and Will Usher as well. And, uh, it came from, uh, actually this is now a 11 year old simulation that was done at Ranger at the, univers at the University of Texas. Uh, so we're far behind the times <laughs> in terms of what we can handle. But even this, uh, when this came out last year, this was you know, probably one of the state of the art large scale scientific visualizations that, that you see. Uh, there are just not a lot that are much bigger in terms of, of what they can handle. Um, so that's completely unstructured geometry and unstructured topology, uh, what you just saw there. Um, but you can also have the, uh, structured grid, you can have structured grid topology and unstructured <coughs> geometry. So the points are not really structured nicely in space uh, you, you, using a nice rectilinear structure. Uh, they can be anywhere in space, but you have some underlying topology that connects them together in a nonlinear way. Uh, so this is what physical space looks like, and this is what your computational space looks like. Or you have another example here with curvilinear data. Uh, that's a lot more straightforward. Uh, but there are actually a lot of finite elements codes, um, especially higher order finite elements codes that have grids like this. Um, so, you ha um, so the spectral finite elements, I, I think, is especially um, a good example of this. And... Uh, I guess curvilinear data, which you see a lot in, in CFD simulations, uh, that, that's, that's this example. So this is what a curvilinear grid would look like. Uh, this, is, uh, this image came out of Graz, but I think there are very similar um, simulations that are being done uh, with, uh, I think there's a, there's a curvilinear extension to, uh, um, to Fun3D that they use to generate simulations like this. Um, and then there's a, uh, actually a lot of uh, computations that I've seen coming out of the Nectar group. Uh, Mike Kirby uh, here at, uh, the, at, at the University of Utah works a lot on computational, uh, on spectral finite elements uh, like this. And it's funny, when I was trying to look for examples like this, I googled Nectar, which is the name of the code, and this was the first uh, image that came up. <laughs> it was uh, this hairband from the 80s. So yeah, uh, they, they, these, very often these guys like to keep a low profile. They're, I would say, not the most typical um, uh, structured or unstructured volume uh, uh, data that you'll see, but, um, but there, there's still a lot of larger, more specialized computations that use this. Um, so that's, uh, again, uh, structured, uh, yeah, structured topology. And now we're going to talk about completely unstructured topology. Um, so here we have, uh, uh, and to have completely unstructured topology, you actually have to have a mix of elements. You can have both uniform elements uh, and mixed elements, um, 
And then you actually need to store vertices and indices separately. There's no way of getting around it. Um, and I'd say the most exa common example of this are general purpose finite element codes that have a mixture of TET and HEX. Um, it's important to note some of, the, uh, some of the pure TET or pure HEX codes would still be structured topology, but once you have a mix of both of them, you're all sort of into unstructured land where you have to be able to say, okay, this element is a TET, this is a HEX, this is something else. Uh, and the codes get more complicated and your data model gets more complicated, but these definitely do exist. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people have taken to calling any sort of um, finite element code, even if it's simple TET meshes, unstructured. It's sort of a shorthand, it's not technically accurate, but, uh, but that's, that's what's uh, sort of happened in the biz community. And I guess the way to look at it is it is unstructured from a geometry standpoint, but if you're looking at topology, um, it would have to be mixed elements and mixed mesh types before it's really unstructured. Um, so yeah, these are some examples of finite elements. Um, uh, you, you have, uh, I'd say a lot of CAD um, and engineering uh, problems are, um, are using finite elements codes. It's by far the most co uh, common example I can think of. But also in uh, bioengineering, you see a lot of finite elements codes. Our own in-house ski run software uses finite elements as its computational workhorse um, on just simple uh, uh, tet meshes. So this is the grid of, of what uh, of what structured versus unstructured does <coughs> with respect to geometry and topology. Uh, so if you have a, a uniform grid, um, that's uh, again structured topology and geometry, and you can have a, cur a curvilinear mesh that is unstructured geometry but structured topology. Um, and then if you have raw points or mixed finite elements or anything really messy where you need a very specific data structure to encapsulate it, then that's uh, unstructured with respect to both topology and geometry. Um, and in scientific visualization and spatial visualization, we're usually talking about geometry. So structured means in practice rectilinear grid, um, uh, which is usually but not always uniform. And unstructured is everything else. So, yeah. So I'm just trying to understand, like, if you say like unstructured, but then you still can like represent it, right? Like, you just have to store all the points. So does, does structure mean like you can get some position information from like an implicit, like the location of it in an array kind of thing? That that's the idea. Is if you know the dimensions, then you'll be able to find the position of the element you're working for. You'll be able to hash to it. Yes. Okay. Whereas unstructured. Whereas unstructured, in a sense, it's actually very arbitrary because you can still hash to it. It's just that you actually have to have a real data structure to get to that. So that you have to build your own custom. Yeah, you have to either build your own hash or you have to have a more complicated hash. I agree. It's actually kind of arbitrary. It's it's more convention than anything else. Now that you mention it, um, but usually we're talking about the division between regular grid and everything else. Um, when we're, and we're talking about um, structured versus substructured geometry. So uh, this, uh, just a quick example. Yeah, can ever, and, and can anyone tell, looking at this picture, which are really just a bunch of raw points, is this um, uh, structured or unstructured with respect to geometry? Show of hands. Who thinks it's structured? Who thinks it's unstructured? Okay, it, it's unstructured. <laughs> um, I, maybe it's, no, it's, it's unstructured. Uh, like, unless it's curvilinear and there's a focus out here somehow. Um, but then, even then it would still be unstructured geometry. Yeah, so it's, it's unstructured geometry. Uh, but structured topology, possibly, if there was a curvilinear focus out here. Okay, next one. Structured or unstructured? <coughs> With respect to geometry again. Unstructured. unstructured. Yes, un <coughs> unstructured. So um, it uh, looks like a TED or hex mesh. Um, With respect to topology, it could be structured. Uh, but with respect to geometry, it's going to be unstructured. Okay, this one's going to get a little bit trickier. Ge uh, structured or unstructured? Uh, 
Okay, so this is almost like a detective st uh, story here. Um, most, um, most of the medical visualizations like this that you will see came from a CT scan or MRI, and they're usually emitted by the machinery itself as a, a regular grid. However, the original data source came from, um, uh, uh, came from a, uh, uh, a, a tomographic reconstruction, which is actually spectral, uh, so that's actually a little bit messed up. We don't need to go into that. But the, the source of this data is usually just a regular 3D grid, um, 3D array. Most of these data sets are, are, are structured. Uh, so just by looking at it, if it looks like it's medical, um, and it looks like it's a scanned data set, it's usually going to be structured and not unstructured. And what you're saying is the, the instrument software itself gives it that structure for an output. Yes, it came from a scan. Um, the instrument uh, 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 hardware uh, gives it to some software that puts it in a grid, and that, that grid is almost always structured. Correct. Okay, last one, structured or unstructured. Notice there's no mesh at all. Yes, yes. Um, okay, so this one's a little bit more complicated. Um, most of the simulations that do any sort of flow over a body need to have a mesh to represent that body. And it is very inefficient and very often, uh, with respect to physics, wrong if you use a structured grid to represent flu uh, fluid flow over a, an, uh, an aircraft or vehicle body that's a mesh. So it would make sense to do this as a finite elements computation, and that means with respect to geometry, it's usually going to be unstructured. Um, that, that said, if this shows up on any test or quiz, we're going to go very easy on everybody. <laughs> I'd say they're more like food for thought questions than anything well, that I've been really, really hard and uh, punishing people for getting wrong. Um, so yeah, basically structured is um, regular grid, uh, unstructured is everything else, um, and this is with respect to geometry. Yeah? Okay, so when we're talking about topology versus geometry, is it fair to think of it as sort of Topology is the metadata behind geometry that you can derive geometry from topology. In a sense, yes. Topology is a much abused and overused term, but topology generally refers to connectivity, um, how things are, how the vertices are connected together. Um, there's also this kind of continuous setting innate topology, which I'll talk about three lectures from now. Um, but yeah. It's, uh, that, that's, I'd say that's a good way of looking at it. Okay. So, um, well, in addition to, oh yeah, sure, go ahead. Um, just curious, so you're showing a ribbon diagram of a protein on your slide there, wherein the, and I've used that kind of visualization of proteins and stuff before, where does that fall in kind of this spatial viz, structured, unstructured? Ah, uh, yeah, that's, that's in, this is molecular viz land all of a sudden. Okay. Um, so that's interesting. Most of the molecular simulations are going to be um, things like uh, molecular dynamics or, or maybe DFT, but for these it's usually molecular dynamics. And most of those are some variant of n-body with, with potentials. So I would, those are really unstructured data, but this is a sort of a secondary structure classification coming from unstructured data. But yeah, anything that's particle like that, anything that's n-body is going to be unstructured. Because like the raw data, like on a previous slide, you had extra crystallography, and the raw data from extra crystallography is really weird. It's a bunch of points on film, so then they have to somehow assemble that. That's true, so, yeah. When I think of points, you're right, extra crystallography, that's, that's uh, yeah. yeah, that's a good point. You, it, it doesn't really fit neatly into the yeah, I think any time you have something on film, it's going to turn into an image, and that yeah. image is usually going to be some grid, and so that's going to be structured. Um, okay. But it might uh, be artificial structuring? Yeah, kind of uh, scan data is really weird. I mean, usually when you're talking about unstructured versus structured, it's, it almost has more to do with how it was computed, and, uh, but if it wasn't computed at all to begin with, if it you know, came off of, uh, off of film or if it came out of uh, a CAT scan, for example, yeah, exactly. all bets are off in a sense in terms of the source. Um, yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, interesting. 
Yeah, and in a sense, these are almost more like conventions than, than they are hard ground truth. Uh, I mean, you heard here structured versus unstructured referred to a lot in, in the Sidemus community, but, uh, but you don't really, uh, yeah, in, in some cases that's ignoring where it's coming from originally. Uh, but yeah, th th this, um, I, I guess the whole point of, of this slide was to talk about how these are more guidelines as opposed to actual, uh, uh, you know, hard, hard classifications. Um, you, you can have lots of non-field geometry, so um, I, I would say secondary structures and molecular visualization are a great example. Uh, you can have um, annotations, um, for example, labels. Uh, these aren't really part of structured versus unstructured. They're uh, more like something that you would add on. Um, and I'd say this is maybe when you, in GIS, where you start to go away from just pure spatial or scientific visualization into info and data visualization, it's because you have these annotations and uh, additional information that don't neatly fit into some concept of a field being structured or unstructured, uh, or having nice properties that you can just kind of enumerate. Um, so um, what do we do with, with, these, da with these data? So in computer graphics, um, it's, it's fairly straightforward. You just have a triangle mesh and you want to render it. And in visualization, that's not really the case. You have um, some uh, big block of, of data um, that exists in, at points in space. And you want to find a way to render that. It varies usually continuously over space. And you need a way of sampling it and turning that into uh, an image on the screen. And there are two general, general approaches to this. There's uh, direct visualization and indirect visualization. Uh, and again, these are also somewhat arbitrary, just like structured and unstructured. Um, so indirect visualization, the idea is that you take your data source and then you run it through one or multiple filters. And for example, you're going from your, your original structured data set and then you convert that to triangles, and then you, you render those triangles. That's, I'd say, the con a canonical example of indirect visualization. So start with a source, transform it to something else, and then render. And the alternative to this would be direct visualization, where you start from, um, from your source, and then you do di rendering directly from that source. And you have some mechanism for filtering it or classifying it uh, at render time. And oh, uh, and this is, these are not um, hard classifications. Um, these are really more of a spectrum. Uh, the idea is that uh, the data, most data have to be processed or classified somewhere after acquisition. Um, and this direct versus indirect is not really an absolute uh, classification, but it's relative. And really direct, you can have really more direct or less direct. Uh, direct means less processing prior to rendering, and indir indirect means more processing uh, prior to rendering, which brings up the questions, how do the data need to be transformed to get the desired analysis, and what does the target rendering method uh, or rendering API require? Um, so in a sense, there's no such thing as an absolute pure direct rendering or a pure indirect rendering, it's just really more direct or more indirect. And here are just a few examples that we'll see in, in scientific visualization. Um, so uh, for example, I, I'd say the, the most direct I can think of would be volume rendering from raw data, if that raw data had you know, no, no intermediate pre-process or post-process at all. Um, you also have direct isosurface ray casting. That's maybe a little bit less direct because you at least have this notion of an isosurface that you want to extract. So there, there's a little bit more of a classification there. Then you have splatting, which is really still kind of a, a direct rendering mechanism, but you're using a rasterizer typically to, to, uh, to sort of rasterize certain primitives that are sampled at specific places in the data set. And then, yeah, as you go, go more towards the indirect spectrum on this side, we have things like marching cubes and rasterization, where you, you had to actually extract an isosurface, turn it into triangles, then render those triangles. Uh, and then, on, I guess, the far left of the uh, end of the spectrum, you'd have sort of full visualization pipelines or full imaging pipelines where you're starting off with data in one format and it's horrible and needs to be segmented and filtered and curated in uh, many, many, many different ways before you finally turn it into something that you actually want to look at. Um, so again, these are, uh, there's no pure direct or pure indirect, but it's a big spectrum of more direct or less direct techniques. 
Um, and collectively, we refer to this process as the visualization pipeline. Even with direct rendering techniques, you still have things that are uh, that are that really have to be filtered, have to be classified. Most data, if you if you do no other sort of uh, filtering to it, it's going to be very uninteresting. And I think most of visualization is about how you do this filtering. Um, and even in the case of direct volume rendering, it's still helpful to think of a, a chain of operations. Um, and uh, this chain, this chain usually takes the form of a flow, a chart, or a tree, or a network. Here are just a few examples um, from uh, Ski Run, and I guess this would be the uh, mid to late 90s when Steve Parker was working on, on Ski Run, uh, which was in a sense uh, um, built on IBM Data Explorer and visualization packages like this that started with visualization in a certain format. It would have a lot of, um, a lot of operators applied to that and you'd have rendering coming out of it. Ski Run, I think, is especially interesting because it's not just doing this for visualization, but also for the compute engine at the same time. So it's almost more like a computational workflow that does visualization as opposed to just a visualization tool. Uh, one that we use a lot today in scientific computing is, um, uh, is Paraview. And here, uh, it's really more of a tree workflow. You can sort of see on the left side, this is what Paraview's uh, uh, visualization pipeline is where you start with a data source at the top, and then you have um, uh, a few of these tabs that pop out and show um, really uh, just a, a left to right sequence of operators that you apply to different sources. So it's quite a bit simpler than what you had in Ski Run or Data Explorer. Uh, and then you have um, a project uh, that Claudio Silva worked on when he was at University of Utah, uh, and that came out of his group called VisTrails. And this is almost more like an abstraction of what you'd have in other visualization pipelines, where you can actually use different pieces of software to accomplish various parts of the, the visualization pipeline tool chain, and you can tether them all together in one application uh, and uh, achieve something called provenance, where you're able to actually backstep and figure out where every individual operation happened in the chain, and you can easily uh, uh, reverse it. Uh, so that, that's, in, in, I think, a very powerful idea. So, um, yeah, I guess now we're talking maybe more about how these are implemented in practice. So the standard bearer, um, so standard bearing software in scientific visualization that we have, mostly because it's been pushed farther than, than anything else at this point, is something called the Visualization Toolkit, or VTK. Um, and what makes it very powerful is, is it's really a full-fledged data model for structured, unstructured, particle, any type of data that, that you really want to have. Um, it's um, really some pretty horrendous C++ code uh, that was designed circa 1997 and uh, has uh, not gotten less complicated, but it does everything. And it's very hard to disagree with a data model that does everything. So it has persisted, and it has been used in, I'd say, most of the scientific visualization applications that really have a complicated data model problem to work on. Uh, it has hundreds of analysis filters. Um, I'd say the most popular that people use are things like marching cubes, common clip planes, streamlines. Um, and again, what, besides that, what makes it really tick are the, the fact that it has uh, a lot of readers for different scientific formats. Um, you can call it from, as a library from C++ code, Java, Python, Tickle, and the, there are a few limitations that I won't go over here, but the biggest one is that you have to actually um, code for it. You have to call it via script, um, and uh, you're going to have to get down and dirty and, and learn the VTK API. Um, and the other big limitation is that the data model, while it's uh, really general purpose, it can be very heavy, very memory inefficient, um, and not what, what you want to use, for example, if you just have simple particle data or simple uh, regular grid volume data or something else like that. Uh, but it always works. <laughs> so here's, um, if you uh, read the Stefan Bruckner uh, short paper that I uh, sent for sign reading in the class, here are just some examples of cell types in VTK. These are sort of like the basic language, the basic primitives of visualization that VTK has. Uh, so you have everything from points to lines, polylines, triangles, triangle strips. Then you have quads, um, polygons, tets and hexes, and, uh, and voxels, and a structured grid. Uh, 
and you have these attribute types, which are sort of like the elements of the scalar field that I was talking about earlier, or elements of a grid. Uh, you can have scalar, vector elements, uh, normals, which are you know, really uh, like vectors, but are sort of interpreted in a slightly different way. And then you can have tensor or matrix elements. Uh, so you can see VTK is really designed to do everything um, it, uh, for better or worse. And here's sort of a, just a simple pipeline in VTK. Uh, where you start off with a reader, um, you uh, create, uh, you choose one of the many, many available data models which are um, implemented in a C++ object-oriented programming manner. Here it's a VTK structured point, so this is a, a regular grid data set, uh, structured data. And then you're going to apply a filter to it. A filter is one of the, the operators in the pipeline. Here it's a contour, which is really the same as an ISO surface. Uh, that's going to spit out VTK polydata, so uh, this is VTK's fancy way of saying a bunch of triangles. And then you have a, a mapper, which is basically a way of getting uh, that data onto the screen. So you have my poly mapper, uh, uh, which, which basically is just a simple way of rendering it using OpenGL. And boom, you have an isosurface of your structured data. So we ended up having one, two, three, four, five different uh, steps in VTK to basically render uh, a volume here. But this is maybe one of the simplest examples I can think of uh, in, in VTK. So um, that's, that's uh, grids and data models in a nutshell. I think now we, we're actually doing fine on time. So I will go through interpolation. So interpolation um, is the process of converting from discrete data to continuous data. So I mentioned fields and grids. And here, the whole, the whole point is really to go from a grid to a field. And the question we're asking is, how do we find the value of a point inside a grid which has discrete uh, vertices somewhere, according to some data structure? Um, and depending on whether your vis technique is indirect or direct, you might have different goals. So for example, in indirect visualization, you're mostly asking yourself, how do I find vertices of the triangles that I want to rasterize or spit out on the screen somehow? And with direct visualization, it's more often the question, I have a sample point in space, how do I find the value of this sample? Now, either way, you're going to end up interpolating. The only thing that changes is which algorithm you use for that and if it's 2D or 3D interpolation in some cases. Um, and specifically, you're, we're asking the question, we want to evaluate the field uh, f at some point x, uh, where x is a vector, uh, usually in this case. Um, and you'll hear the term filter kernel thrown around a lot in scientific visualization. Um, this, the filter kernel is really referring to the method of interpolation. So the way we do this, it, um, the, the, the method of interpolation, for example, trilinear or tricubic beast line or Gaussian, uh, this is the filter kernel of the field f. Um, and obviously, this, this might be a little bit redundant, but it goes without saying that mesh choice has a strong impact on the choice of um, yeah, both the filter kernel and how we actually do the interpolation. Um, so we, uh, uh, you can actually have raw points in space, uh, and you can interpolate this using just a bunch of Gaussians or, or some sort of unstructured uh, uh, filter kernel. Or you can have um, a, a mesh that looks like this, uh, where you have to interpolate with respect to just this triangle. Um, and this is in turn going to be quite different from this mesh, which has different connectivity, and you would here interpolate with respect to this quad. Um, so you can see it's not just the the filter kernel itself, but also the mesh that sort of dictates the result you're going to get. Um, so, yeah, again, we're talking about going from discrete to continuous. Um, and I guess the last that we should probably mention, there's a difference between interpolation and approximation. Very often, I will refer to interpolation using Gaussian radial basis functions. Other people actually tend to consider this as more of an approximation or even an extrapolation. Um, in, a, in a sense, they're all kind of similar, um, but uh, the interpolation has to satisfy some specific rules. For example, partition of unity very often, uh, where you know you're going to be able to uh, have 
the value that you sample in the middle be less than uh, or be well bounded by the range values of the vertices on the outside. Um, so, for example, going back to this slide, if I just had a bunch of Gaussian radial basis functions and no partition of unity rule, and I was uh, trying to sum them up and find the sample using that, um, that would be a filter kernel, but it would be sort of an, an approximating filter kernel as opposed to an interpolating one. And if you have a nice trilinear, uh, actually, I guess, um, very centric coordinate by linear interpolant here, that would be a, a nicely well-defined interpolating kernel. Um, so, uh, in, in, in general, uh, when we talk about interpolation, we're, we're uh, almost ignoring that distinction. Uh, so the simplest way of doing interpolation is to not really have any filter kernel, and that's just to pick the nearest neighbor, the nearest vertex to you, and say that's probably what this value is. Uh, so, for example, here uh, we have a bunch of points at 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, and we want to know the value at uh, 1.3. Um, and if you just did nearest neighbor interpolation, uh, that 1.3 would map to 1, and you just pick the 1 and call it good. Uh, so it's really just a kind of a floor operation, and that's exactly this. Um, so a slightly better way of doing it is to use the value of the two closest points and weigh them. And that's what linear interpolation is. So here we're looking at the value of 1.3, and we're going to use a nice, uh, we're going to actually ignore all of these other points. Um, we would need to use higher order interpolation for that. But for linear interpolation, we're just going to look at the two closest neighbors, and we're going to um, add their weighed values to get the value of, of 1.3. Um, so we're basically trying to look for the value uh, at this point right here. So we're going to uh, subtract off the 1, and we'll get the 0.3. And then we're going to weigh them with respect to the values of the 1 and the value of the 2. Um, and that's exactly how you do linear interpolation. Um, and that gives you this, this nice one here, uh, which is L of 1.3. And this is the code for doing linear interpolation. Uh, quick show of hands, who's seen this before? Oh boy, yeah, okay. Um, y equals mx plus b? Um, uh, 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 what, sorry? Is it like y equals mx plus b? Basically, yes. It's, it's, it's just a straight line interpolation. Um, it's just a linear function. Um, and it's uh, changed a little bit uh, because you're looking at two endpoints. Uh, so it's really just y equals mx plus b plus a reference frame for, for the, uh, the vertices that you have. Exactly. Um, this is, you'll see this over and over again in graphics, this lerp function. Lerp stands for linear, linearly interpolate. Um, and what it's uh, uh, interpolating between a and b at the point t and the function is 1 minus t times a plus t times b. So now we're going to go from one dimension to two dimensions. So what we saw with linear interpolation was just along the line. Bilinear interpolation is um, along a square in 2D. And again, we're talking to, about structured data, so just uh, images. Um, I'll show you an example in just a slide. Uh, so again, we're, uh, bilinear interpolation is really um, the process of interpolating twice, once along the first dimension and then another time along the second dimension. And you actually need three sequential linear interpolations to accomplish this. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to move along um, the, the ty coordinate right here. Um, and then, and you actually need two interpolations to do that because you actually need to find it with respect to both x coordinates, uh, the upper and lower, to get that. So you'll get these a and b points right here. And then you're going to do one last interpolation between these two points to get the c. And that will give your nicely, the value of your nicely interpolated point. Um, and this will, this will give you the, the value you're looking for. And if you do this over a grid, uh, suppose you have a bunch of vertices that look like this in an image, and you uh, apply a bilinear uh, interpolant filter kernel on it, and this is what you'll get out. Um, you'll, you'll get something that looks like the glorious graphics from the early days of, uh, of Doom or something like that. Um, yeah. 
Now, trilinear interpolation is just slightly more complicated, but it's the same principle exactly. Instead of having three linear interpolations, it's uh, for bilinear, it's uh, an additional four interpolations to um, interpolate with respect to the third dimension. So here we have, we start out with four points, the A, B, C, D, and then we're going to interpolate all of those. Then we're going to uh, sort of collapse them to two interpolations, the E and F, um, using uh, two linear interpolations. And then we'll have one final linear interpolation to go to G, uh, interpolating between E and F. And that's, that's basically trilinear interpolation. Um, and once you have trilinear interpolation, this little image that we have here, it's sort of hard to show an analogy of this. Um, so when we think about trilinear interpolants, um, we all of a sudden are in volume uh, visualization territory. Um, and here we're, I'm, I'm just showing some isosurfaces uh, that come, uh, came from the, uh, uh, the uh, Stuttgart, actually no, yeah, um, from the, I think it's like Klaus Engel's page from the early 2000s. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, you'll, you'll find them. Uh, these are still the number one hit if you, uh, if you Google for it. Um, so this is what it looks like inside one voxel, um, where you have the, the voxel vertices and you're doing a trilinear interpolant and looking at one contour of, of that trilinear interpolant. So this surf surface shows where the value would be a specific value, like 0.7 or something like that. Um, and then if you do this for a regular grid, um, then you end up with a nice connected isosurface like this, and you can still see there's some, some artifacts where um, it's um, continuous, but uh, but only uh, C0 uh, but only C0 continuous at the edges of the cells, so right here, and that's what results in these sort of interesting artifacts like this. Um, actually, I'll skip ahead and show you what happens if you do higher order filtering. Um, you, uh, yeah, actually, yeah, no, that, that, we'll, we'll go with the slide. So if, um, it, the, those artifacts that I showed in the previous slide of the isosurface, if you volume render this, then you still end up seeing them. There are these sort of weird bumps that you have here, uh, or these weird uh, sort of jaggies that you have uh, in, the, in this example. And if you use a nice higher order filter to visualize those data, you can largely get rid of that. Uh, if you use a smoothing interpolation uh, kernel, uh, filter kernel, you'll end up with something nice and smooth like this, or uh, nice and smooth like this, compared to this. So that's where you, want to, you would want to use a, a smoothing filter to clean up your data. And you can do this uh, for both images and for all <coughs> It's the same, same principle. Um, so instead of having to, I mean, this is how you would implement this in, in actual code most of the time, but the general formula for trilinear interpolation is really just some product of the xi, yj, Z, uh, zk um, functions, which, uh, which are defined like this, and then you're basically doing one of these for each voxel and summing that up. And for a general higher order filter, um, Again, we're talking tensor product filters, not, not Gaussian filters, for example, which would be something else. Uh, but th this, uh, this is what you would do for, for example, a tricubic B spline, uh, where each of the Bs would be the uh, cubic B spline basis function. And uh, you would be uh, taking a product of these. Um, we call this a tensor product because we, uh, the people who came up with these filters tended to like to think of these as matrices. Uh, but really, it's just a product of all the functions uh, across each dimension, and then using them to, uh, to weigh each voxel vertex that you have. And yeah, again, uh, uh, trilinear is nice and cheap, and something higher order, or higher order like a B-spline filter is going to be beautiful, but more expensive. And actually, I think I might be well under time. <laughs> Time for questions. Yeah, any questions? Okay, well thank you Aaron. Um, quick announcement, there is, I don't know, some of you know uh, that, but there is SkiX happening tomorrow. And SkiX is this event where Ski, like our home institution, 
presents their work. Um, and so this is going to be tomorrow starting at, um, is it at 1? So open house, uh, starting at 1 at, from, at Ski from 1 to 6. Um, and then it's followed by a lecture from Jim Clark, if you haven't heard of Jim Clark. Uh, he's the guy who founded uh, SCA, um Silicon Graphics. Let me see. Yes, he founded Silicon Graphics. So he's a Utah PhD alum, uh, founded Silicon Graphics, and then founded Netscape, and has since, since like run a couple of other companies. So he's a very prominent Silicon Valley uh, Utah grad, and he'll give a lecture at six. So if you want to see what research happens at Ski in general, so anything related to scientific visualization, information visualization, scientific computing, image analysis, and so on. That's tomorrow, and afterwards this lecture, uh, it's open for everyone to come. Um, it is hosted because of supercomputing, which is in town this week, uh, but you're all invited to, to drop by and, and see what we're doing. And then on um, Thursday, um, we have the guest lecture by Jenna Diwasa, and uh, I hope to see you all there.